Uh, my name is Johanna Bergman and I'm from uh, I'm head of project portfolio at AI Sweden and with me today I have Anders Thoreson, uh, one of the project managers working with media and democracy um, and we will guide you through this uh, webinar um, and we're really happy to see so big interest in this topic and also uh, that we were able to really quickly set up this webinar. Uh, it has been a lot of discussions the last weeks with partners and other interested persons wanting to know more. So we're really happy to be able to have this webinar today. Um, so I think Anders, I leave it to you to guide us through the first part of this webinar. Yeah, thank you, Johanna. And again, welcome everyone. Uh, this afternoon is split in two parts, one hour each. Uh, and uh, during the first one, we'll get a broad overview of what GPT-3 are and how it can be applied in a more general sense. And the second hour will be more technical depth. Um, so during this first hour, we'll first listen to Magnus Salgren, who is a PhD in comput computational linguistics and head of natural language processing group at RICE. And when he's finished, uh, Lube Börjesson and Martin Malmsten will follow. They both work at the National Library of Sweden, Lube, as a director of KB Lab, where Martin is a data, data scientist and IT architect. Uh, during the presentations, please uh, ask any questions in the chat, and I will moderate the discussion with the three of them afterwards. Uh, and with that, uh, please, Magnus, uh, the scene is yours. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen here. So you should all be able to see my screen. Hope you do that. So the idea is that we will start with a very general overview over this model um, and how it relates to current research in language AI and what is so special about this particular model. And we'll dive straight into the central question. So, so what is GPT-3? Well, GPT is an acronym and it stands for Generative Pre-trained Transformer. Now, I think this actually is quite a good uh, acronym for this model. It explains exactly what's going on here. It's a generative model, which means that it can be used to generate data, and in this case, text. So it's a pre-trained model, which means that it has already learned uh, linguistic knowledge that we can then apply to solve various types of linguistic problems. And we'll look at some examples of that here in this webinar. And lastly, it's a transformer uh, model, and Ariel will talk more about what that means. And of course, uh, the number three indicates that this is the third generation of this model. Now, it's important to also note that what we're actually talking about here today is a research paper um, called Language Models for a Few Short Learners. And that was published uh, at the beginning of this summer uh, by a group of authors, all of them from uh, OpenAI. Uh, OpenAI is a private uh, research organization. And we should note that this paper has not uh, been peer reviewed. So uh, a normal practice in, in science is that we submit our research papers to journal or conference, and then it will be reviewed by other researchers. And if it uh, is in a good state, it can be published. Uh, if it's not, it will be rejected from publication. Uh, so this paper has been uploaded on a, what's called a pre-publication server uh, called Archive. Uh, and so there has been no peer review. And in fact, we're sort of doing it right now and in all the blogs and podcasts and YouTube videos about this model. So, I mean, something could be said about how uh, papers like these transform the scientific method, but I guess that's a discussion for another webinar. And um, all the examples that we have seen also online have been, as far as I am uh, aware, uh, produced by not having direct access to the model itself, but by querying an API so people have submitted questions through this API to the model and received answers. So in a sense for us researchers to talk about GPT-3 is sort of like doing a car uh, review without having actually driven the car just by reading the specs. But, but it is what it is. So here we are talking about it. But so um, the title of this paper makes it clear what we're actually talking about. So GPT-3 is a language model. So, so what is that? Well, a language model 
is uh, some form of computational model that learns a probability distribution over language. And this can be done in many different ways. The earliest language models were quite simple probability-based models. Uh, nowadays, we almost exclusively use uh, neural networks uh, to build language models, and we call them neural language models. Uh, there are many different ways of training uh, neural language model. The arguably simplest way is to use what we can call a unidirectional sequence prediction task. So imagine that we, that we see a number of words, like the cat sat on the... And then the task of the language model is to try to predict the most probable next word. So in this case, uh, the model might give high probability to words like math or floor and low probability to, to things like, uh, I don't know, happiness or pandemic, perhaps. So what is the point of doing this then? Well, when we train a language model, we can then use the language model to generate probabilities for sequences in language. And this is quite useful if we work, for example, with machine translation or speech recognition. And of course, since the model has been trained to predict the next word, it will typically also be useful to generate text. Uh, and the way that we typically do that is we provide a prompt to the model, like the cat, and then the model can generate the most probable next word and it can continue generating the most probable next words. Um, from a research perspective, what we are mostly interested in is perhaps the ability of these uh, neural language models to actually form a, an interesting, useful internal representation of language. And this has become one of the main research areas in current AI. Uh, we typically refer to this as representation learning. And it's not a new idea. It's been around since the early days of neural networks. Uh, a good example is Jeff Elliman's uh, very classic paper from 1990 called Finding Structural Time, where he used simple recurrent networks trained in exactly the type of uh, language modeling tasks that we saw earlier. And uh, what he noted was that the network will learn useful internal representations of the input uh, units, of the input words. And these representations will approximate parts of speech or semantic word classes. Um, and of course, from a linguistic perspective, that's perhaps not very surprising. It turns out that you don't even have to train the network. Uh, you can actually arrive at these semantic representations by simply aggregating context information. Um, and this has become the dominating approach uh, to learn uh, semantic representations for natural language. It's called distributional semantics. And it's, it's the underlying idea with representation learning for uh, using language models. Um, the reason why we uh, think this is an interesting research direction is because uh, we can use these representations for lots of different types of tasks. And this is a very nice image from one of our deep learning experts at RISE, Enrique Ulipta, and it demonstrates the idea. So first we train one of these neural language models, or we use something else that learns a semantic representation, and then we can apply that representation to solve various types of NLP problems, like text categorization or sentiment analysis or question answering. So it's a, it's a general tool to, to do NLP. Now, representation learning recently has been completely dominated by one particular type of model, which is called the transformer. Um, and Ariel will uh, tell us all about the details, but this really started like three years ago uh, with a paper from Google called Attention is All You Need. And that gave rise to the BERT language model uh, two years ago, and that has been enormously influential and spawned uh, a huge family of offsprings. And, and this picture is by no means complete. There are lots of other uh, transformer-based uh, variations, and new models pop up basically every week. So it's uh, impossible to keep track of everything at the moment. And you see uh, up to the right, you have the GPT-3 
uh, progression. Uh, so first the original GPT, which was then uh, transformed into GPT-2 by simply adding more uh, data and a big, bigger model. And then we have GPT-3 today, which is basically the same model, but just bigger and better. Okay, so, so what is special about this model? Well, we already touched upon it, right? So there are, from my perspective, two interesting aspects here. So one is the, the, the size of this thing. It's huge by any standards. Uh, the size of the training data and also the size of the model, uh, it's, it's enormous. And also the way that uh, the authors of the paper use this model to solve uh, NLP problems. It's in, in the standard setting, what we would do is take a language model to produce representations and then we would add a classification layer on top that we would train to perform some NLP task. But this is not how, how they use GPT-3. Uh, rather, they formulate instructions in natural language and then they use the generative abilities of this model um, to, to solve the problem as a sequence prediction task. So, so this is um, an interesting uh, way to use these language models. And I'll give you some examples of, of how this is actually done. But uh, we have known for a long time that uh, size matters when it comes to data for natural language processing. That's not a new insight here. There was an influential paper some 20 years ago by Banco and Brill where they scaled uh, NLP solutions uh, to what they call very, very large corpora, which was like one billion word uh, corpora. And that was huge at the time. And we, of course, also know that uh, representation learning mechanisms for language uh, benefit from, from seeing more and more data. Uh, now, looking at the size of the data that GPT-3 has been trained on, it's, uh, it's huge. It's closer to 500 billion words that this model has been trained on. And I think Louvre and Martin will talk more about uh, the data aspects here. But of course, the size of the model also matters a lot. Now, I don't expect you to be able to see uh, what it actually says on this graph here, but uh, on the bottom low end to the left, we have the original transformer models like BERT. And you should keep in mind that those models were huge when they uh, were published some two years ago. And up to the right, we have GPT-3, which is the latest language model. It's orders of magnitude larger than anything we have seen uh, so far. I think the model contains like 170 billion parameters or weights in the neural network. And that's, that's a lot. But having said that, there's always a bigger fish uh, in the pond. So just very recently, there was another paper uh, from Google where they published a, a method called G-Shard uh, that is even bigger than GPT-3, some 600 billion parameters. Uh, and you see the development is just this year. So it's really a scale race that we are witnessing at the moment. And it's, uh, it's a bit challenging to keep up for a small research institute in a northern part of the world with uh, not so much economic uh, powers. Um, and of course, I mean, the, the, the idea of scaling these models to, to so large sizes is because we see uh, an increase in performance. And this is a picture from the paper where they show that across all the different tests that they do in the paper, we see an increase in performance when we uh, increase the number of parameters in the model. Uh, Right, so the other thing that is unique here is the query method that I already talked about. So instead of formulating uh, NLP solutions as a first software classification problem, they formulate tasks as natural language instructions. So uh, as an example, if we want to translate words into another language, we would, uh, we would ask the model, uh, in natural language, translate English to French, and then we would give the word that we want to translate. Um, and they uh, present three different variations of this, something called zero shot, which is basically what you see on the screen, simply the instruction, and then something called one shot, where you have the instruction plus one example, 
and then few shot, uh, which is instruction and, and a couple of examples of the tasks uh, to perform. And of course, I mean, this might seem as sort of magical, uh, but it's um, perhaps not uh, so surprising that it works, given that we have trained a huge language model uh, to predict the next word based on a very large context window. So in effect, uh, when we formulate these instructions, we're sort of delimiting the, the search space of the model, or we're priming the model to look in a particular domain, and in that domain, it will then start to generate the most likely uh, next word. Uh, it, it is interesting that it works, and it, is, um, it opens up for new applications of these type of models. Um, so to wrap up this uh, brief first uh, overview, uh, what we're talking about here is a language model. It's uh, relatively simple, at least with regards to the training objective, uh, but of course it is huge. It is very, very large. And what we see in the paper and in all the published examples online is that when you do uh, training of a language model on this size, there is a lot of training data, a lot of parameters, you will end up with a very powerful model. And what is interesting is that you will be able to use this model to solve a large number of specific tasks uh, without actually uh, training the model to perform them. So uh, that concludes my first overview. And I guess I'll leave the word to Love and Martin, or maybe Anders. Actually me, for, uh, I, I have one question for you uh, at this point, Magnus. When we yes. were preparing for this, for this afternoon, one of the things that you highlighted was the differences between how GPT-3 learns a language and how we human does the same. Mm -hmm. uh, how we're talking about massive amounts of text, more than any of us ever have read, yet we are better at understanding language in, in, in many ways, because we uh, read uh, body language, uh, hear the tonal voice, etc. Uh, do you see a future where uh, AI language models will use multiple stimuli, so to speak, to, to do its work better? Yeah, so it I don't think it's a sustainable research direction to simply just scale these models, to, to just add more data. At some point, we're going to run out of text data. Uh, and as you say, that's definitely not how we humans learn language. So we, we use all our senses to learn uh, language and concepts and information about the world. And that is one of the more interesting research directions at the moment. And it's something that we do research on here at RISE uh, to look for multimodal models. So models that not only learn from text, but learn from text and image and video and audio, etc. cetera. And, and it's not clear to me that you can't learn everything you need to learn about language by simply reading text. Maybe you can, but it would definitely be, I think, uh, easier to arrive at the coherent model faster if we could use more types of stimulus. Uh, thank you, Magnus. <laughs> and uh, Luva and Martin, uh, over to you for the next part. Yep. Uh, thank you, Anders. Thank you, Magnus. Um, my name is Luva Burson and I'm the director of KB Lab. So, and KB Lab is an infrastructure for data driven research at the National Library of Sweden. Uh, my lab has built uh, KB BERT, which I believe is still the sort of gold standard of Swedish and vanilla BERTs. And we are together, of course, then with RISE, AIs, uh, AI Sweden, and others. Uh, we're building newer, bigger, and better models. And we will ultimately take a shot at what Magnus calls an absurdly big Swedish language model. So be it a GPT-3 or a very large Electra or something really, really big. Uh, but that will follow perhaps later this year or next year. Um, and we do this, the lab and KB, we do this because KB has a lot of copyright protected data that cannot leave our premises. So in order to use our vast digitized collections, models need to be built in-house here at KB. And we see it as a service to the Swedish society that no one else can sort of provide right now without our help. And 
it would be better if our data could be accessed from uh, outside, but that's not the case right now. So uh, we have to have the competence at the library and we have to have the computational uh, resources as well. And we have to have all the cooperations we do have now with RISE and AI Sweden, etc. So uh, regarding to the release of GPT-3, I, I think it's, it's a fantastic event and a giant leap forward in sort of in the pursuit of a general artificial intelligence. But somewhat, somewhat less attention has been given to the fact that this model also reveals the weaknesses of transformer-based models. They do not really understand language in the way we understand uh, the word understand. It has, for example, a very hard time understanding relationships uh, between sentences. Do, for example, two sentences uh, contradict each other or uh, does one entail the other, etc. These are questions that uh, even this fantastic model has a very hard time answering or addressing. So um, there is something sort of um, increasing size, more text, larger networks in the way that uh, uh, Mangs described, obviously produce results in a way that no one expected a few years ago. But as the author of this paper uh, of the uh, GPT-3 paper, as they themselves describe, are we closing in on the limits now of pre-training, uh, of the current pre-training objectives? And if so, what will come next? If it, if it doesn't help scaling, if that's sort of, it's a diminishing return of, of increasing size, uh, what will then come next instead? What would be the next giant leap forward? Well, first of all, I think there will be an, uh, a few really big models uh, up ahead, but we also believe that as Magnus and, and, and uh, Anders were discussing that there will be new types of language data, for example, voices, facial expressions, context, etc. And this is a very exciting development for the KB because we have that kind of data as well. Uh, we have, for example, many, uh, many, many millions of hours of, of broadcast uh, Swedish television. Um, and also, as the author of this uh, GPT free paper suggests, there, we think there's going to be a shift from uh, simple prediction objectives when training to something similar to goal directed actions, sort of a more general uh, training objectives. How that will, um, how the architecture around that will be constructed. I don't have uh, a clear view of that, but uh, yeah, I'm, that's my guess. I, I think that's gonna happen and it's gonna happen pretty soon. Um, so speaking of language data though, we have lots of it here at the KB and it comes in many forms. Uh, so we have uh, uh, digitized newspaper articles, we have uh, stuff from the internet, we have uh, a lot of uh, digitized uh, TV uh, shows, etc. Uh, and whatever the dire direction and the development of these models take, data is going to be an integral part of the algorithms. So, so with that, I, uh, I leave the floor or the board or what I should say to uh, Martin Malmsten. He's a data scientist at the lab and he will talk a little more about, about the data at the KB, what we have and what we can produce uh, to, to model. So. Uh, Martin. Yes, uh, my name is Martin Martin. Um I'm a data scientist at the KB Lab, um, and now I'll try to uh, share my presentation. Um, of course, uh, everyone gets really excited uh, about large models uh, done in, in English, which means that they have a huge amount of data, and Swedish is a small language. Um, so that's sort of uh, becomes my job then to try to find all this data <laughs> uh, when everyone is really excited about new models. And someone else's problem is finding enough computing resources. That's not my problem. Um, someone else has to do that. But if we look at the, uh, for example, the, the original BERT uh, that was trained on 16 gigabytes of, uh, of data. Um, and for for the Swedish part that we created, we uh, made a corpus of around 20 gigabytes, which contains of the Swedish uh, uh, wiki text. Um, I don't know what SO, SOUs are, but uh, government um, 
uh, publications, basically. Um, we have illegal e-deposits. Uh, we harvested some uh, data from, from social media. But, but the sort of the large part is, is uh, also our newspapers, which uh, make up 16 gigabytes of that 20 gigabyte corpus. Um, there's definitely, uh, I mean, we could definitely get more data, for example, from social media, but you have to ask yourself how much social media do you want in your, uh, in your language model? Um, you still need some of it, but maybe you don't want to take like 40 gigabytes of, of uh, Twitter. Um, so after, uh, or, uh, with that corpus, we could train, a, uh, like Lube said, a, a bird, a Swedish bird, which seems to perform very well. Um, the corpus is on par with the, uh, uh, the Google corpus, uh, in size at least. Um, but then, of course, uh, came a, a bigger model in Electra and uh, um, Tifo, what is it called, uh, Excelnet. And I think also Roberta uses a corpus of around 100 gigabytes, uh, which is, I mean, it's five, time, five times as big. So after that, we started to, to uh, create the version two of the corpus, uh, which is now at around 100 gigabytes, which means that we use the same things, but we use a lot of government text like propositions and, and protocols, um, more legal e-deposits, more social media, and also a lot of digitized books. Um, it's, it's fairly ironic that the, uh, uh, we don't have a, a, a large amount of digitized books uh, in this corpus, but we're, we're getting there. Um, we used more of the uh, news, digitized newspapers. So we were up to around 100 gigabytes of, uh, of digitized newspapers. So we're in the same, if we go back to this image, we're in the same ballpark as, as what's used for Excelnet. Um, and then, of course, <laughs> came T5. Um, which uses the uh, the C4, which is the more cleaned. I don't remember what it stands for, but it, it's a clean, basically um, uh, the crawled, the clean crawled corpus, something like that. And I think the clean part is around 800 gigabytes. Um, and if we look at Gipti 3, it uses even more, it, uh, from what I understand, it uses the whole corpus, which is uh, around six terabytes um, of data, uh, a trillion uh, a trillion tokens. Um, so then, of course, uh, the challenge is, can we even find that much Swedish data? I saw someone ask in the chat, can we even build this? Is there this, this much Swedish text? And, and honestly, I don't know. Um, but I have to sort of dig where where we stand and try to find a uh, resource at the National Library, assuming that if there are a huge amount of free resources, then we can get them as well. I'm just trying to mine as much resources as, as possible. Um, so if we look at sort of what the National Library has, um, I mean, if we can get to 100 gigabytes using what is digitized right now, uh, we could probably find even more digitized resources. But if you look at the, the sort of just the textual resources, then the National Library, the National Bibliography contains 600,000 books in Swedish. And I think if you look in Libris database, it has somewhere around a million books. Um, of course, some of those are editions. So uh, it's not 600,000 or a million unique texts. Um, but anyway, 600,000 books. The National Library has also, together with other universities, about to uh, digitize all Swedish books from uh, like 600 years ago uh, to today. So at some point, uh, those books will be digitized and the uh, uh, text will be available for, um, for NLP or for corpus creation. Um, the National uh, Audiovisual Archive contains uh, 10 million hours of radio and TV. Um, Honestly, I don't know how much of that is spoken text, but a lot of it is. I mean, there's radio, there's TV. Of course, there's also a lot of uh, songs, but songs often create uh, uh, contain text, even though it's not as much. Um, the news archive it has 25 million digitized news pages, but there are still 100 million pages that are not yet digitized. So if those were digitized, that would be an enormous, uh, that would be hundreds of, of gigabytes. The uh, harvest service uh, called Kulturarv contains uh, 500 million web pages. Um, that's also 
a lot of data. And then there's countless brochures and ads and, and uh, all of the sort of everything that's printed comes to the National Library. Um, it would take a huge effort to digitize all of it, but if we need all, basically all Swedish, um, just all Swedish, <laughs> if we just need all of it to train this, we, need, we probably need to, to uh, digitize everything. Is my guess. So I mean, if we were to create the corpus, this is this is not this is not started. The the version two of the corpus that's basically done. We were using that to train um, a better BERT, or if we're training for a second an Electra or something else, we were using that corpus. Um, if we were to um, train the GPT three, then we would need sort of the version three of this corpus. Um, which would mean digitize all the newspapers, that would be maybe 400 gigabytes, hundreds of gigabytes from, from the web, hundreds of gigabytes from the, from the books, hundreds of gigabytes if we could do speech to text on the AV material. I mean, and, and that is really, uh, it's not a solved problem to do speech to text, so. Uh, but even if we did all of that, we would sort of peat out at maybe, one terabyte or uh, I mean we, okay so we if we had that and we did all of the materials um, that come to the KB we could get over one terabyte and that puts us sort of in the ballpark or maybe sort of in the parking lot right outside the ballpark um, for, for this type of model uh, with a huge effort, we I think we we could definitely get there, and and there are definitely other sources of of Swedish uh, Swedish textbooks. So sort of combined with that, we would be in the ballpark um, to train this type of model. And I haven't even mentioned the amount of compute resources that you would need to 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 train it. My guess is that Ariel with uh, uh, will uh, expand on that. But so from a corpus sort of corpus standpoint. It seems sort of feasible, I think is my is my pointer. It it can be done, I think. Um, I guess the big question is if it can be done while this amount of of uh, um, text is still uh, relevant. Because because like someone said, um, humans. I mean, we we learn language with a lot less. So, uh, uh, but then again, I mean, huge. Uh, corpora is always good for for NLP, so uh, I think this is a, it's a good thing to do. But uh, yeah, it puts us in the ballpark. Uh, that was the last one. Um, that would put us in the ballpark um, or slightly outside. Um, but it's a lot of work. Yeah, that's it for me. Thank you, Lova and Martin. Um, there are a lot of interesting and good questions coming in through the Q&A function. P please keep them coming and we'll start with one of the most uh, uh, common ones. And you have all three of you already touched upon this, but I think we can elaborate on it a little bit more. And that's the question about what, what's needed uh, in, in terms of, of data and computing power to in the future have a, a Swedish version of GPT-3. Uh, what's needed and is there a road to that? Well, I um we need more computational power if we start in that end. Uh, and um, I don't think uh, the library now, we're investing uh, a lot, but we will not be able to sort of accumulate that computational power all by ourselves. So we're going to need to cooperate also. Uh, so that's one thing. And also looking into the architecture and perhaps training um, objectives, etc. Et it's something that we need to do in cooperation with others. So. So more computational power and as Martin has described, more uh, data. So that's from our point of view, stands into that. We, we have seen numbers on how, how large the corpus for, for training GPT-3 has, has been, but what, what about uh, raw numbers for the computational power? What, what's actually needed to, to process all these data? Well, um, uh, I don't really know what the how many uh, processes they're actually used for the GPT three. Maybe Martin or Ariel. I, so yeah, I, I will I uh, will we'll touch good. upon this in, in, in my presentation, but oh. uh, it's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. then, then we wait for for the figures a, a, a little bit more, Ariel. Great. Um, 
Magnus, you, you showed a picture, uh, or rather a, a map, uh, over a lot of different language models where GPT-3 is just one of, of many. Uh, why do we need different language models in the first play, and will there eventually be one that rules them all? Um, so, uh, this is just a map of transformer models. There are lots of other types of representation learning methods for natural language processing or natural language understanding. The, the, and I think Ariel will talk more about the specifics of transformers. Uh, these are huge models and there are lots of architectural choices to make when you build one of these models. And there are also lots of different choices to make how to train these models. And all the different uh, variations that you saw on that map, th those are variations of that, right? It's variations of how you build the architecture, it's variations of how you train the model, it's variations of the data. I mean, you had GPT, GPT-2, GPT-3, the only thing that is different is basically the size there, right? But so, uh, the field of deep learning is a little bit like alchemy at the moment. We're trying out what works, what's, what doesn't work. Um, we don't really understand why things work, uh, at least not in a fundamental level. Um, and I mean, we're aiming for building computers that really understand language. Um, so, uh, but I think Oriel will talk more about the transformer landscape and how that sort of plays yeah. out. But, but, but if you look at all these different models from a implementation application perspective, if you are in an organization that wants to do stuff with uh, language models, how much do you need to understand about how the models work and how they differ? So are, are there different models that are better or worse, uh, worse for, for, for different kinds of real life applications? Yes, I mean, definitely. So GPT-3 is specifically designed to generate language. There are other architectures that are much better for, for producing useful representations that we can use in classification tasks. And I mean, when we talk about building a large scale Swedish language model, it, I, from my perspective, it's not necessarily a GPT-3 architecture that we should use. There might be other more pressing needs, uh, for example, I don't know, some other architecture might be uh, better to use uh, for the large scale Swedish model. Yeah, okay. Uh, Magnus, you, you highlighted that the query method is, is some of the special features with, with GPT-3. As I understand it, you, you actually uh, interact with the model in, in natural language, uh, that you kind of prime the model uh, with a sentence or paragraph that, that leads up to the text you, you wanted to, to generate. Uh, does this mean that, that in the GPT-3 landscape, at least, we, we will see new skill descriptions in, in, a, in a recruitment where, where you are looking for people who are good at priming GPT-3 to perform and, and write the kind of text that you are looking for. Yeah, I, a recruitment, I don't know. But I mean, you could definitely imagine a future where you have these. I mean, realistically, I think we are looking at a future where we have uh, machines that generate text fairly well, right? And I probably we will see automatically generated books. We will probably see auto-generated movies and music. And that's going to be weird for one generation. Then it's going to be the normal standard, right? And I think maybe you could imagine like uh, the role of the artist becomes more of a design. Uh, so you, you design the model and you design how you query the model. You could definitely imagine that. Yeah, okay. Um, if we had, had had an AI that clustered the, the, the questions that have come in, we, we would have another cluster uh, in, in, uh, around whether this is, could be considered a, a, as a step towards uh, AGI, artificial general intelligence, and whether this is actually a computer understanding language. Are there any kinds of, of uh, this in, in this model? Yeah, so the short answer is it depends on what you mean by understanding. So what is understand language? Do we even, we use the word understanding for lots of different things, right? I mean, understanding is that being able to detect parts of speech or to, to form a syntactic analysis or to answer questions or to express needs, right? These models are very good at 
identifying structural relationships in language. So they learn syntax, they learn grammar, they learn semantic classes. They don't have an intent, right? So they will not, you know, just start to speak because there is nothing that drives them. And they will probably not be able to recognize a picture of a coffee cup if you show them them because they haven't been trained on that, right? Uh, but do they understand language? Yeah, they do from one perspective. Do they understand language in the same way as we humans do? I don't think so. But I've, I've seen examples over, over, over the summer where uh, GPT-3 has been used to, to write computer code. Uh, I've understood that even the GPT-2 could be used uh, to, to teach a computer play chess. Uh, and, and a lot of things that we humans do are, could be expressed as written text. Does this mean that we could, could train uh, GPT-3 on, on instructions for robots or, or other kinds of stuff in the physical world and, and have GPT-3 to, to uh, perform real life physical world stuff? So if you train GPT-3 on text data, it will be confined to textual knowledge, right? But once you start training these models with multiple senses, uh, the knowledge and the information that these models will have will cover these different senses. And I don't know, it, if, you, if you then add a robotic arm to one of these models, it might be able to, at some point, start picking up coffee cups, right? Uh, if, you, if it has a camera. Uh, uh, so I, I'm not really sure how to answer that question. <laughs> I, I, I would like to add something quickly, and it's it's uh, so what you're describing is something that goes on in time, right? So th these models they are they are not real time, so so they they operate on a static sequence. So so um, uh, you would need to invent some other parts, right? So in terms of predicting what will happen next, maybe these models are. Uh, very good, but but uh, in terms of operating in real time in, in the world, uh, there is some parts missing. Okay. Um, Lova, here is a question addressed uh, to you. Uh, the text resources at KBR, are they available for, for researchers at universities and, and for, for people in, in, in corporate life? Yes, but you have to use them at the library. So you have to be you have to come to the library, to the lab, and use uh, the resources here. Okay. And we have an infrastructure for that. Uh, it's unfortunate, but it's, it is, uh, as Michelle Obama said, it, it is what it is. So. Uh, a related question that uh, has, has also been asked is, what is KB's uh, interest in, in this area in the first place? Why is this something that you work on at all? Yeah, well, so uh, KB has in his instructions to support uh, research and to sort of promote uh, the development of a democratic society. And we do that in different ways. And one way is to, to use our digitized uh, resources, be it text or otherwise, uh, to use them in such a way and to help others to use them so they can be used, for example, to build language models. We see that language models can be used to rationalize stuff that we do in society, in, in governmental agencies, but also in, in corporations. Uh, so it's, um, it's part of the basic sort of KB instructions to do this. And, and we see that we have the largest collection of at least editorial texts uh, by far in Sweden. Uh, uh, and since it's sort of locked into the library, we need to take part in these processes to be able to use this data. So RISE, for example, for them to use uh, our collections to build models, they need to cooperate with us somehow, and we need to cooperate with them. So, uh, so our interest is sort of it's it's in the uh, task of the library, the basic task of the national library too. Okay. Can I add something here? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, if you look at the computational resources that go into training one of these models, the, the, those are huge efforts, and for a small country with the small languages mm. like. Swedish, we really need to work together. Mm. There is no way that one actor will be able to produce these kind of resources for Swedish. So I mean, all the actors in Sweden, we need to pool resources and build this for Sweden and, and yes. buy Swedish data. And that, I think that's a very important thing. And that's the reason why we all want to co cooperate on this. 
uh, along those lines, one of the questions that have, has come in is about cooperation with the other Nordic countries. Uh, what possibilities is, is it there? Uh, sharing uh, corpuses, etc., and, and computational power to, to, to build at least a Nordic GPT-3, perhaps? Yeah, I think that's a great idea. And we've been in contact with the Norwegian National Library, and they have a, a great lab uh, there. Uh, and we have not been so fortunate when it comes to the Danish uh, library for some reason. But so uh, the idea is uh, it's not that, but it's it's we have the difficulty with sort of how can we transport data or can we transport the model? Uh, but it, it should be possible to do that uh, using the resources of the other national li libraries as well. Uh, another can interesting I, can question. I, can, I, can I add yes. something? Sorry, Magnus. <laughs> sorry, sorry for interrupting. But I think also from a model perspective, uh, what we have seen with these large scale transformer networks is that they, you can really benefit from, from transfer learning between languages. And mm. the Scandinavian languages are basically the same structure. So I think that we will be able to build better language models for all the Scandinavian languages if we can train them on Scandinavian data more generally. Yeah, okay. Uh, is saying so the corpus version number three that Martin is talking about that could be something that would, will contain Danish and uh, Norwegian yeah. context. And, and Martin has something to say I think. Yes uh, just to reiterate and make that clear I mean even though we can um, sort of expose the data we will always expose the model of course um, and just to Again, say that again. That I mean, if you have the pre-trained model that is created uh, here or somewhere, then you can then you can fine-tune it for your for your task, and then you probably then you don't need all of the data that was used for pre-training. So um, the, the, I mean, that's a big part of these models that we, we release a pre-trained model that doesn't uh, contain any uh, copyrighted material. It's just a model, uh, and you can use that one. Yeah. Oh, okay. And uh, another question here is. Uh, also from one of the participants is uh, that GPT-3 is, is so data intensive, wouldn't it be a better idea to, to look for other data models, uh, language models that isn't so data intensive and, and, and leave GPT-3 and those kinds of models that... that it demand a lot of language data who wants to take that photo? <laughs> no, well, I, I mean, uh, the game's afoot. We want to have a big model in Swedish as well. <laughs> so, so we're going to build it somehow. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, we, we are definitely going to, to test the, the borders and the limits. Uh, but but it is an interesting question, though. I mean, what we're seeing now is a scale race, as I said, both with regards to data and model size. And, and it's not sustainable in the long run. Mm. neither just throwing data at the model or just throwing parameters at the model. Mm. So we really need to also look for at least alternative approaches. I think. Okay. And we, and we do. I mean, we, we released the Albert model, which is a much smaller model. So it, it's, it's not GP3, GPT-3 or nothing. It's, uh, yeah. Um. We're going to start wrapping up, but, but, but a few questions about how to use GPT-3. And, and some of you said, one of you said that it's not possible yet because you have to apply for an, for an uh, API key within, uh, from OpenAI, who, who is the organization in, in US who has developed GPT-3. Uh, if, if we start there, what do you think about the decisions that not making the, the, the technology public yet? Is that a good idea? a responsible move or, or what, what do you think? Generally, so I to release them. That's my point of view. Well, one point there is that the model is so big, so you uh, need your own uh, cluster of uh, graphic cards uh, in order to build it. So uh, I, I, I agree with the work that they uh, should release it, but no one or very few people would be able to to run it. Mm. But, but the, one of the reasons that they have decided to, to do it this way is, is for concern about fake news and, and this model being used, uh, uh, put in bad use. Uh, is there anything to that uh, that worries you think? So I think, I mean, it's quite obvious that these 
type of models will be able to generate text. And if you, if you give it a prompt, it will start generating text based on that prompt. But it's not a new thing that you can auto-generate text. And if you, if you only want to flood the internet with auto-generated text, you don't really need GPT-3 to do that. In fact, you can use humans to do it, right? <laughs> uh, so I, I don't know. I mean, obviously, it is a risk that people will use it for these purposes. You know, is it a serious risk? Uh, GPT-3, not so much for us, I think. But if someone would have access to uh, Kunga Bibliotheket's entire data set and, and produce a sequence generator for Swedish, that might be a problem for Sweden. Is that the reason, uh, Lou, that, that you can't just, uh, that you have to visit you to, to, to get access to the data? That, that you should... has entirely to do with copyright you know, uh, rules. But it is a problem, and we have been discussing with Rice and others also the uh, Swedish Defense Research Institute. Uh, what happens when we have a good text generating model uh, based on KB data? Because then you can uh, have it to generate. Uh, something that looks like a total legit uh, news article. Uh, so there are some concerns, but... Um, we got a question about copyright as well. Is there a, a reasonable risk that models like this could, could leak copyrighted information in ways it was, wasn't intended? No, I think they're irreverse. They're, you can't really reverse the process back to the text. Okay. Um, if if you leave the the bad uh, applications of GPT three aside, where where someone actually wants to use it for for bad stuff, uh, if if you are an organization that wants to use uh, GPT three uh, for an internal process in one way or another, uh, th there has been a lot of discussions about data bias and how how you train your models, etc. Is there any specifics in in regards to GPT three or, or other transformers that you have to be aware of when you want to apply? this in your organization? Uh, the bias that's in the data that goes into the model uh, will, still, uh, will still be there when you use the model. So for example, there is a higher st the stronger statistical relationship between uh, uh, some gender and some, for example, work positions, which you have to take into account. If you were to use the model to suggest, uh, you know, apply for this or that job, it will sort of inherit uh, the bias that's uh, in the data that goes into the model. Uh, one thing that Magnus pointed out when we talked about this is that we, we already have bias <laughs> when we are using humans. Uh, but when we use models, we can actually measure and counter the bias. So, but you should be aware of it. I, I think another perspective also is these models are so big, and Ariel said, I mean, particular GPT-3 is so big that you need a cluster of GP, powerful GP, GPU cards to run it. Mm -hmm. So it's not obvious for a, an organization, do you really need to use this type of model? It's sort of like shooting flies with a bazooka in many cases. <laughs> you can really solve NLP problems in using simpler models. Uh, in, in terms of implementation, there, there was another, uh, uh, area we were discuss, discussing when, when planning for this. And th that was that an organization doesn't always have benchmarks how well their human employees perform I w when they produce text or, or categorize text, etc. And, and because of that, it's hard to, to decide whether a language model, anyone, is, is good enough for implementation because you have no, no uh, baseline to, to benchmark it against. Could, could any of you uh, elaborate a, a little bit on that? Well, uh, librarians, sort of a central part of their profession is to, uh, is classification. They have uh, some object, it could be a book or something, and then they need to classify it. And uh, it, it has been measured how well uh, librarians perform. So even if they work at a specialized library where they knew the text extraordinarily well, uh, the baseline is about 75% or so correct uh, classification. And, and this is uh, largely unknown by librarians, I think. <laughs> so uh, they think they're uh, very close to 100% and they don't trust models, which is a natural reaction, I think. But, but for sure, when we, when we suggest the application of a model, 
we almost always compete with 100% accuracy uh, because the baseline is uh, unknown and, and, and it's also surprising, I think, for many professions, uh, the humans or baseline that's lower than expected. Yeah, I think it's not specific to language models or, or GPT-3. This goes for any machine learning application. So, I mean, the expected performance should always be measured with human agreement, I think. So first, figure out how, how good are humans that are doing a task, and then you can benchmark the models. Yeah. Uh, one, one final question. How do you measure and counter the bias in, in models like, like this? Well, the first problem that I think has been discussed a little bit too little is what is an unbiased, you know, what, what, are, we, what are we comparing with? Uh, and that depends. I mean, because for example, we, want, we, we may want a gender neutral model, for example, in some cases, but in some cases we don't. And uh, when it comes to medicine, for example, uh, the, the, uh, there are differences between uh, bodies and there's a sort of, uh, and another thing is that when researchers use this model, they may be interested in the bias, so we can't really take it away. Uh, so it's a little bit more tricky than sort of first meets the eye because we sort of, you want the models to sort of be neutral, but that's not necessarily unbiased. So that discussion needs to sort of come first, I think. Yes, many. I, I completely agree with Lovia, and I, I think it's, it's difficult to cleanse a model of all types of biases. Then it, the model will not be able to understand language. Mm. But, but I think what is most important for us when we work, for example, with, with the public sector and building language models for the public sector is to, to control what type of data we put into the model. Mm. So, and, and, and obviously we would like to have data that is so free of unwanted biases as possible. Uh, and that means probably not using social media so much and use maybe more news texts. So I think, I mean, controlling the data is more important than try to correct for things in the model. Okay. Um, Magnus, Lova and Martin, thanks for great presentations and a nice Q&A. And Ariel, thanks for joining the Q&A as well. Uh, Johanna, I leave it to you and Ariel now. Yes, thank you. And thank you, Martin, Lova and Magnus. And please stay if you want to um, and uh, join the discussion after Ariel's presentation as well. I think we have so many good questions coming in from the audience so we will try to answer as many, many as possible also after ariel's uh, presentation um yes so now it's time to dive a little bit deeper into the technical details of gpt3 uh, and i think you can present yourself ariel um and also what you want what you what you are able to what you should talk to about Sure. So my name is Ari Rekvian and I work with Magnus at the RISE in the Natural uh, Language Processing Group. I have a background in engineering physics and uh, in the startup sector before joining RISE. So I'm starting my screen share now. Can you see it? So one second. Can you see my mouse pointer? Yes. Yes, awesome. So this uh, will be a more in-depth uh, technical view of uh, transformers and specifically GPT-3. So I will start with the model architecture and then go on a bit uh, to the data and the training procedure and then wrap it up. Uh, there will be some overlap, but uh, I, think, uh, I think you can manage. So what is GPT-3? Oh, sorry, one second. Let me start a timer. I think I could go on forever. So it's better to have one. So GPT-3 is a next step prediction model. It's a transformer model and it's very large. So next step prediction, it's basically autocomplete, right? So you all have it in your phones and uh, yeah, you're used to it, but the GPT-3 is a very big autocomplete. So we want to figure out what is the most likely next uh, word given uh, some history of words, right? So for example, what is the most uh, 
likely next word in the sentence, the winner of the US 2020 election is, I, I don't know, let's uh, uh, let you figure that one out. So GPT-3 is a transformers and transformers like Magnus said was uh, introduced in the 2017 paper, attention is all you need. Um, but I will not start there and uh, straight into the transformers. I will start with tokenization, right? Because we need to feed the transformer something. So given a sequence of uh, characters, a text, we, we need to um, convert them into something that the transformer can work with. So in the case of GPT-3, they use something called byte pair encoding. And that is the technique to segment the text into a fixed vocabulary. So if you would uh, just split at white space, uh, you would get words, right, in English. And uh, we have a lot of English words, so we would get a very large vocabulary. And that might be a problem in a transformer model because we uh, use embeddings as the start of the process. So uh, in GPT-3, they have a vocabulary of 50,000 units. So uh, th that also means that uh, the tokens, the units, will not always be full words. They can be part of words. So uh, in the example of a largely unknown fact here, they might split up large to two tokens, large and B. And that is uh, uh, positive in, in the context of this because we can have a fixed embedding size. So an embedding is basically a big matrix of floating points of numbers where you assign one token, uh, a word, or a byte per encoded token to one row of the matrix, right? And, and uh, this, has, uh, this is good for several reasons. Um, so that, that is what is fed into the transformer architecture. And uh, in general, transformer architectures has uh, two key components that, that is used over and over again. Uh, I mean, there is a lot of details in the transformer architecture, but in, in order to really understand the GPT-3 models and transformers in general, I will focus on the two most important parts, and that is self-attention and feed-forward layers. So I will start with self-attention. And this, this is a bit complicated, right? But we have gone from taking a sequence of characters, text, we have created vectors, uh, the rows in the embedding matrix. So what can you do with these vectors? So you will have a lot of, uh, given a, a sentence, you will have split it up into pieces, and each piece is a vector. And then you can do self-attention. So you take one of these words, that is a, a vector, a sequence of numbers, and then you do a linear transformation to a query, a key, and a value of a vector, right? So from the original token, the word, for each token in a sentence, you get the query, key, and the value matrix, a vector. And then you can calculate how much should each word focus on the other words. And you do this by taking the query from one word and doing the dot product with the key from either the same or the other words, right? And with vectors, the dot product produces a, a singular value, right? So it's a weight. Uh, and then you take this weight and you say, this is how important this word is, right? So you, you multiply it by the value vector that is also produced from an embedding. And then you take the sum of these embeddings. So for each word, you get a, a, a weighted sum over all the other words by these uh, uh, vector operations. And that is your attention. So 
I, the, the key takeaway from this is, is, is that it's, uh, uh, you kind of uh, take a word and you check how, how, how does this relate to the other words in, in the input sequence of, of tokens. Uh, but what I just told you is that for each word, you want to produce a query and a key uh, vector. And, and you want to check with every other word uh, how, how important they are. And that is uh, quite resource hungry because it's, it scales quadratically the length of the sequence, right? So, so for very long sequences, you will have to check a lot of times. But that, that is just how it is with, uh, with uh, um, this kind of attention. And there are some technical details like the weights that you produce here, they in, in practice, they are summed to a distribution with a softmax and you have some weighting going on there. But, but the important part is, is, is just to think that an embedding is a word and, and you produce a query and a key vector from that word and you uh, check with the other words how important they are. So that is uh, attention. The other part is the feed forward layer. And anyone who has worked with neural networks uh, should be familiar with the feed forward layer. So it's basically, again, we have these embeddings. They are d-dimensional. And in the case of the transformer, we have a linear transformation that uh, expands the embedding to, to a larger dimension. In transformers, it's often four times. Then you have an activation function that uh, it's a nonlinear transformation that operates on this, and, and then you project it back into a smaller layer. So basically, this, this allows the weights to intermingle with each other, right? And then putting these two parts together, you have a transformer layer, right? So again, the embeddings here in the bottom, the tokens, words, or parts of words. And then you take them and you feed them into an attention layer where they all interact. So in this part, in the first part, uh, the full sequence is interacting with each other. And you get out uh, another embedding that is the weighted sum. And then in transformers, we have something called residual connections. And that is basically just taking the original embedding vector and adding it together with the output of the attention. So you just, you just add them together. And then you normalize. That's basically keeping the vectors uh, small. Then you put it into the feed forward network. And then you and do the residual connection, which is just adding in the vector from this part to the output from the feed forward network. And you normalize. And this is a single transformer layer. And I've mentioned normalization. In transformers, you have something called layer normalization. And uh, there are a couple of learned weights in that. But basically, it's, it's to keep the uh, vectors uh, uh, small, right? You want them to have a, a, a low magnitude. And part of the reason you both normalize and do these residual connections in, in machine learning is that it helps the network to learn. Uh, you get smaller gradients that can propagate easily through the network. So putting this together, this is just one layer of a transformer. But I, I hope that you are somewhat familiar with the parts in it now. So how, how does it uh, actually produce uh, predictions? So, oh, sorry. So here we have the uh, uh, sentence, the cat sat on. And for the first word, we the D, we have an embedding representing the word. We feed it through the network. And in the end, we uh, get, hopefully, cat. Right? And from cat, we uh, propagate it through the network. And hopefully, we get the word sat, and so on. But what we get out in the end, is yet another embedding, a vector. Uh, and 
how do you uh, change this vector into the work? Right? I mentioned in the beginning that we have this embedding matrix that represents the words. So we take this output embedding and we compare it to all the vectors representing words in our embedding matrix. And we see which one is it most similar to. And we do this by taking the vector dot product and having a softmax. But, but I hope you get the idea. Uh, there is also some additional details. You, you, you often don't actually take this embedding, right? But, but this is the idea. So in, in practice, when implementing a transformer, there's a lot of details, right? I'm, I'm glossing over a lot of details like uh, padding, batching, initialization. When you're training it, you have to change how, how fast it uh, changes the weight in the network. You want positional coding, you want dropout, and, and, and a lot of other stuff. But, but the main thing in a transformer is this, this little part here. And this comes for all the transformers, right? They, they, they consist of some variation of, of this part. So uh, there is a lot of variance on the transformer architectures as well. There's uh, different encoders and decoders. You can have recurrent memory and sparse attention. Like I said, you have a lot of different training objectives. You can manipulate how, how the network is uh, routed and uh, these different types of positional embeddings. But the GPT-3 architecture does not include most of these new model developments. So diving into the details about GPT-3, it is 96 stacked transformer decoder layers. It has multi-headed self-attention. GPT-3 uses alternating dense and locally balanced sparse attention patterns, the layers of the transformer. And these I, I did uh, describe dense attention to you. If you want to know more about the sparse attention used in, in the GPT-3, you can read up on the paper generating long sequences with sparse transformers. Uh, and uh, <laughs> so, so I, I mean, I show, try to condense what, what our transformer layer is, right? But the GPT-3 has 96 of these layers on top of each other. But basically, you're, you're still feeding in these embeddings, that is uh, uh, the tokens, and each layer outputs an embedding, and then it just feeds in layer again, again, again. And the uh, uh, transformer has an embedding dimension of, uh, or the GPT-3 has an embedding dimension of 12,288 which is huge. So we have uh, Magnus uh, has worked a long time with uh, other techniques for creating embeddings and, and uh, word to rec and uh, random indexing. And we used to think that 300 dimensions was large. So here we have 12,000 dimensions. Uh, you have a vocabulary of 50,000 hyper encoded tokens. You have a sequence length uh, of 2048 tokens and that that's quite long right you can get quite a long document or several sentences in that which is nice if you want to uh, produce longer text or, or have a, a longer input and I, I mentioned the feed forward layer it's also large and it has 96 self-attention heads and, and basically uh, this just means that you do attention on parts of the embeddings. So you split the embedding up in, in several smaller parts and, and you do attention individually on them. And the model also has a batch size of 3.2 million, which is also incredibly large. So if, if you train some kind of model on your own GPU at home, you're, you're happy if you can get a batch size of 64, right? So, so this is uh, quite a bit larger. 
So I, I, I told you in general about transformers, but that also applies to the GPT-3. So if you want to learn more on transformers, you can read all the academic papers, but there's also very nice resources online, like the Illustrated Transformer. You can Google it and you can get to know what the transformer does. There's the annotated transformer, which goes through the, the original potentially all you need paper. And uh, uh, then if you want to get into various types of transformers, you can look at the implementations from hugging face. Moving on to the data. So uh, like we talked about earlier, uh, the GPT-3 uh, was uh, mostly trained on, on web data derived from Common Crawl, where they uh, downloaded 45 terabytes of data from 2016 to 2019. After filtering, they came up to 573 gigabytes. So I, I, I would like to have a small correction to, to the previous speaker. Uh, I, I, uh, so GPT-3 does not use uh, uh, terabytes of data, but it's still incredibly large, right? So GPT-2, the, the previous mode from OpenAI, uh, it was trained on 40 gigabytes of text data, GPT-3 on 570 something on there, T5 and Roberta, which are uh, models from, from the T5 is a model from Google. It, it, it was trained on 750 gigabytes of data from the common crawl as well. And the common crawl is, is uh, basically web scrape data that is uh, available for anyone to use who, who has their compute resources or, or wants to pay for Amazon. And the, the split of the data that they have trained GPT-3 on is mostly web data and some books and uh, Wikipedia. But when they train it, they, they weigh the Wikipedia heavier, so they will show more examples of Wikipedia. And the reason for that is that they think it's more trustable, basically. And as we also touched upon, uh, bias, right? So, so the data will be biased, or the model will be biased because it ingests data from humans, and uh, humans are biased. So uh, I, I don't think there is much more to it either. Uh, but of course, how to handle that in practice is still unsolved. So go, continuing into the training of the data, of the GPT-3 model. Uh, <laughs> so OpenAI works with Microsoft. I thought, think they were bought by Microsoft recently. And Microsoft provided them with a data center. So uh, this data center has 10,000 GPUs and a very fast uh, connection between the GPUs. And uh, the GPUs are uh, NVIDIA, Tesla, V100s, and uh, an approximate Swedish price for, for one of these GPUs is uh, 80,000 Swedish crowns. So I mean, I'm just making this number up because there is no official one, but like assuming a bulk discount, you would still have to pay half a billion to just buy the GPUs, uh, right? So, so this is a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, the horsepower, so to say. And uh, I mean, so when you have these models, right? Uh, they have 96 layers and, and a lot of uh, floating point uh, values everywhere in these uh, layers. So uh, it, one model would constitute 700 gigabytes of data. And uh, in order to train the model the, the regular way, you need to load the model in, onto the graphics card. But the largest uh, graphics card out there right now has 48 gigabytes of ROM. So the model doesn't even fit on the graphics cards. So in, in order to train these large models, you have to use model parallelism, where you split the model up into uh, parts and load the parts on the GPUs. And then the GPUs have to talk a lot to each other in order to share information about the, the state of the models. 
And in this, uh, going from loading a full model to a GPU, uh, to splitting it up over different GPUs, that is, uh, involves quite a bit of engineering work. Uh, Microsoft has released a framework they call uh, DeepSpeed that uh, has a lot of these tools that uh, I think uh, OpenAI used, at least they used it in the Turing NLG model that they, they released earlier. Uh, so they have shared this, this engineering work with us. And uh, so if you, if you don't want to uh, buy your own data center, you can, of course, uh, train this in the cloud. You can rent this on, uh, from Google or Amazon or uh, Microsoft. So, but but uh, uh, a guesstimate of the costs of training one instance of the GPT-3 model in the cloud, uh, you, you would, uh, I, they, they, they um, tell us in the article how many flops, which is a measure of compute time uh, or, or compute, how many flops it took them to train this. So assuming the maximum performance of, of a V100 graphics cards and a, a, a low uh, rate uh, on a cloud, uh, you, you uh, find that it would uh, cost uh, approximately uh, 4.6 million US dollars or 40 million sec uh, for, a, for a single training run. So, so even if you would rent this infrastructure yourself, it would uh, cost quite a bit and probably you will not uh, get everything right in, uh, in, on your first try. So you probably have to add some time and money to this as well. And uh, speaking of training, uh, OpenAI has uh, released another paper. It's also not peer reviewed, right? As Magnus said, we work with a, or, or the state of uh, things right now is that uh, things are happening so fast, so we often go by not peer-reviewed papers. But what OpenAI discovered when they experiment with these large models are that larger models require fewer samples to reach the same performance. So, so basically what they are saying is that if you have a limited uh, time and compute, you should opt to create as large mo a model as possible and give it fewer data points. And that will give you a better performance. And this, this holds for newer language models, right? But the larger model, it also performs better if you continue training. So uh, their take on this is that, that you, should, you should strive to work with large models. And uh, like Magnus touched upon, uh, we have this this crazy growth of, of model sizes. I guess that goes into uh, what, what I just showed you, but the BERT who, who made a big dent here in 2018, it was a very large model for its time, but then uh, in, in January this year, Microsoft released the Turing NLG model, then came uh, GPT-3 in May, and now this summer, Google showed this, this uh, G-Sharp model who has uh, 600 billion parameters. Of course, Google has the resources to actually engineer and train this uh, model. So how does the GPT stack up then? Uh, as Magnus mentioned, the, the way we have done things uh, up until now, and probably we will continue with after this as well, is fine tuning. So you take a BERT model, uh, a model that is pre-trained, that has uh, read a lot of uh, text and, uh, and, and uh, learned how language is distributed through masked language modeling or some other task. And then you add a layer on top of it. And for a specific task and you show it examples and you update its parameters. Basically you continue the training. That's fine tuning. That's what we have done so far. And the GPT-3 model it does things differently. So it basically freezes the model after the training and then we just ask it 
We have the theory shot where you just have a task description, a prompt, and we have the few shot where you have a task description and a lot of examples, as many examples as you can fit in, in the, the length uh, of the 2048, and you have the prompt. So uh, the GPT-3 paper is actually quite long. It's 193 pages, and they have a lot of benchmarks. And they, they don't reach the state of the art uh, in most of the benchmarks, but they are also fine-tuned and supervised. They are individually, the models that have state-of-the-art, they are individually uh, tuned and trained to this. The GPT-3 model is not. It's, it's frozen, uh, right? So it's, um, it's interesting, and, it's re and it, it also reaches uh, quite good scores, I mean, compared to, to uh, a lot of other models. My favorite benchmark, one of the my favorite benchmarks is the SuperGlue. It's a collection of uh, uh, tests for, uh, uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, but, but on the SuperGlue, the human uh, score is uh, 90. The fine-tuned SOFA, which is uh, a T5 model from Google, is, is quite close to the human scores here and the uh, original perk large here, that's around 70. And you can see that uh, the uh, GPT-3 GPT models uh, is, is uh, performing quite uh, badly here, still above uh, normal guessing, and this is the various parameters, but as they scale up the model, it uh, increases with the scale, and in the end, with the few shot learning, it is performing better than the original BERT model that was fine-tuned. So I, I, I would argue uh, from the perspective of uh, being a frozen model uh, that's not allowed to update its weights, it's doing quite good, assuming it's not cheating. And that is something they can't control for 100% because when you train on such a large amount of data, some of the tasks uh, in, in these tests might have been the training data, but they try to control for that. Uh, but of course, there are uh, still limitations to what GPT-3 can do. Uh, it can be repetitive and contradictory when generating long text sets. It uh, can stop the, uh, it might not remember exactly what it said, or it doesn't sense fully but but overall this is the best uh, language generation generating model uh, and another uncertainty with the few shot learning is can can it uh, generalize uh, or, or does it simply just store uh, the training data and and the open AI is not sure about this uh, fully, uh, so so I, I I would think that it's uh, possible to generalize, but but that is still uh, an open question. And of course, there is some uh, criticism and controversy around around this. Does uh, does the model uh, really understand language? And uh, uh, there recently came out an article measuring massive multitask language understanding, where they uh, tested GPT-3 for moral scenarios, and it was no better than random. But the rebuttal to that is uh, they were prompting it wrong. So um, it's still open, right? Since you you have to feed it written text and to ask it questions, uh, how how you ask the questions might make a big difference. Uh, so there is a lot of uh, research. Coming, I think, in this area. And some potential applications uh, of the GPT 3 is uh, since we know, we have seen that it, uh, it's quite performant on all these uh, various benchmarks uh, without fine tuning. You can imagine that you can, uh, with the same technique, create new data sets 
right? And the, the way we do this uh, usually is by uh, human annotation, and that is uh, time consuming and very expensive. And uh, the same potentially be done for, for annotation pipelines, where you want to extract uh, knowledge from text, right? Uh, you maybe want to find all, all the mentions of companies in news text or something. And the way to do it uh, up until now is to create a data set. But maybe you can just use a model like GPT-3 out of the box with the right prompt. Uh, you can perform text completion in almost any domain. Sales, you can generate uh, uh, taglines and, and text for online ads. You can uh, aid in writing, health and fitness, you can do code completion and chatbots. And of course, you have some adversarial examples like fake news. So in, in summary, it's a simple model with uh, respect to transformers, but uh, there has been some hard engineering challenges, right? So, so uh, if you put it all together, you have the, the model that is replicable for anyone, I think, that with the in-depth knowledge about transformers. You have the data, which is a step up in, in, in terms of complexity, extracting that, that amount of text in English from the common crawl is, is a bit more engineering intensive. And finally, having the money and resources to actually train this model on thousands of GPUs, it's uh, not accessible to everyone. Uh, I personally think that uh, the model is very impressive and, and uh, yeah, I'm excited for the future. So that's it for me. Thank you, Ariel. A really interesting presentation and we have a lot of uh, questions still and uh, so maybe all the panelists can be prepared to answer um, but I will start with a question about uh, it's so many parameters in this model um, is there a risk for overfitting and or how is the model performed? So I would say that uh, uh, they do not seem to overfit so far uh, if you if you, uh, you you have such a varied uh, training data, and it's, uh, such a large amount of training data that it uh, doesn't seem to be overfitting. Um, yeah, I will just look into the other questions. Um, we have one question: If it's possible to use the GPT three model as a pre-trained model in a Swedish context. Um, so could we use it and just fine tune it to um, to be able to handle Swedish? Swedish. I I think probably the GPT three model has seen some Swedish in, in, in the web, but I think it's it's uh, crappy at Swedish. So uh, with regards to fine tuning, since that we have mentioned, it's locked behind doors. So the only way to talk to the model is via an API. But I've I've heard rumors that uh, they will allow people to fine tune them on uh, through the API. So who knows? Um, and how can you access the model? Or no one can access the model right now, or what is the... So you have to be invited to the beta program. So then you get a, a key, which you, then you can access it through an API. But uh, they plan on releasing it to, to the public um, soon. Really good. Um, yes, yeah, so we have some similar questions here. Um, uh, okay, here is a question. Uh, are the embeddings pre-trained, let's say word to vec or are they learned during the training of the language model? So everything is learned during training. Uh, they, they don't need <laughs> pre-training in that sense. Um, good. We have 
Another question here. How's the speed of GPT-3 as compared to others? And is there any other API other than OpenAI? So speed and are there other APIs than OpenAI? I think the speed question is, is a bit hard to answer since it's happening behind doors. But I, I imagine that the, uh, what we would call inference time is, is I, dependent on, on the infrastructure they use, right? But it's probably fast. And uh, I don't think there is any like APIs for, uh, there is no other APIs for the GPT-3 models, but of course there is a lot of services, everything from Google to, to I know there's a lot of other companies out there have uh, NLT services uh, as APIs, right? And there's the specialized companies as well. Really good. So Anders, feel free to jump in if you have any questions and minus Martin, Lova uh, as well, of course, um, or if you have something you want to comment on. Um, we have uh, a few more questions here. I'm just scrolling through the, the questions. We have a lot of questions. <laughs> I, I, I can take one in the meantime, Johanna. Uh, yeah. There is one yes. question about that, that GPT-3 is, is running the cloud at the moment. Uh, will it be possible to, to run it on normal GPUs off cloud in, in, in the future? I, it depends on if, if they, uh, I mean, a lot of these transformer models are all open on the web, so you can download the weights, right? So if uh, OpenAI decides to release the weights, then, then you could set up your own little uh, uh, GPU server farm at home and, and, and uh, do it there. But since they are selling this as an API, I would say they will, uh, probably not release this uh, for a while. Uh, a related question just came in as well. Are, are models like this uh, suitable for production use or, or, or will the costs be, be too high? So I, I think uh, they released the pricing. I, I don't remember it from the top of my head, but I, I think it was uh, quite expensive. But uh, as a company, of course, it depends on what you use them for, right? So if you're... Uh, uh, return on investment for producing ads on the internet is, is higher than the cost of utilizing this or, or the human labor involved. I, I think uh, you, you might want to like do this one thing that you can then use for many other things so so the the, the general idea the scale they, they show that it's uh, that's one possible future path but but, but are there any, any specific examples or demos around that that you are or any of the others of you have, have seen that really have bl blown your mind I, I can start with one. I, I, I've seen, I mean, this is just people playing around with it, right? But uh, uh, one of my, I, I saw an interview with a, a fellow named Joshua Bach, who, who had a conversation with, uh, a, he's from Germany, and he had an con English conversation with a German philosopher that answered back in German. And they talked about life and death. I mean, I, I think that's really fun. Magnus, Luve, Martin, have you seen anything that, that really blew your mind? Um, as far as examples, I, I think they are cute. Uh, I, I mean, I'm mostly impressed by the sheer size of this thing. Yeah. And especially what Ariel has been talking about, the engineering effort to actually get this up and running. That's uh, impressive. But maybe I should also mention, so I, I think... Uh, while it's fun to train these large models, and we will definitely do so for Swedish, uh, I think it's an important research direction to try to uh, 
representation mechanisms. And I think that's going to be a huge research direction after GPT-3, I think. Uh, th th there is actually a, a question about that as well. Th th this is obviously a, a huge milestone in language technology e evolutionary-wise uh, for the most part. But w w what do you see next? W w what will take language models a, a, a big leap forward in, in new ways, not, not just by adding more data? So if I can start and then Orion can, can continue, but I don't necessarily think that GPT-3 is a big milestone. I think the transformer architecture is a big milestone. And uh, BERT was the first model out. Uh, I think it deserves the credit for that. Uh, GPT-3 is one example of a huge scale model. And we will continue to see these kind of models, I think. But um, from my perspective, and what we are working with, uh, multimodal models is definitely one research direction that is important. We try to, to train models on other types of data in complement to texts. Yeah, so, so I, I mean, uh, I think one interesting thing is so, so they see that um, models can learn more from, from less data when they scale them up. But what if uh, there is coming continuous improvement to, to the models as well, so, and, and the techniques using them. So if we invent new techniques to make the transformers smaller, then you can also increase the size and learn potentially, you can increase the size in terms of depth and, and layers and stuff like that, and, and uh, potentially uh, get more out of your examples. I think that's uh, interesting as well. One question from the audience is, is around energy cons consumption. What, what, what is done to, to make this less expensive in, in that way? I don't think uh, there is anything. I mean, uh, I don't know if some of these large companies announced that they will run in green energy and, and, and so on, but uh, I mean, what, what we have just spoken about, uh, it's energy intensive and, uh, and uh, there's not much to do about it until they invent better ways, of, until we invent better ways of doing it. Johanna? Yes, <laughs> we have some internet troubles here in Gothenburg. I hope you don't have any problems at your site, <laughs> but I think it will work. Um, I have a question to all of you actually. So this is a huge uh, milestone in language technology as we understand today. Um, but what do you see next? What are the next steps and what will be the next milestone? Uh, what do you think? I'll, I'll come back to the multimodal models. I think we'll see a huge uh, step uh, in performance and more general understanding, I don't know if we should call it intelligence perhaps, but once we will be able to train these models on other types of data. So. Anyone else? So we, um, I, I can say the same thing, uh, that uh, I, I think we will see in improvements in, in how the model functions and, uh, and that will allow us to, to utilize more. So we'll get smaller models that we can scale up, right? So, so, so uh, we can learn more from, from less data and then we'll get uh, more human-like uh, understanding. Yeah. Anders, do you have a final question or should we try to wrap this up now? Do you have uh, more uh, questions? Th 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 there, is, there is one more. Uh, wh where do you think that uh, technologies like GPT-3 could, could be applied and, and really make a big difference, a, a huge impact in, in using this technology? 
so I can, I can start. Um, I think that, so GPT-3, to be clear, is a generative model, and it's good at generating language, particularly. And I think there are huge possibilities for helping people with various disorders and disabilities. Uh, people who can't speak or write uh, might be able to use one of these models to help that. And I mean, it's an interesting perspective also. So a couple of years ago, we played around with the concept of semantic avatars where you would train a language model on a person's text. So you could imagine reviving the dead in a way and talking about uh, talking to your dead grandparents if you have enough text to train one language model. That it's a sort of a bizarre application, but you might be able to see some applications like that. But um, more sort of application oriented, I, as we have talked about, it's not necessarily the GPT architecture that is the most suitable to use. So if we are, for example, building applications for the Swedish public sector, it might be other types of transformers that are more suitable to use for the type of task that we're looking at there. So that's, um, it's not clear that we will use a GPT architecture. For that. Okay. So uh, I, I think that we, in, in, in the coming year, we will see if it holds up, right? So, so the question is the quality of, of what it generates, but uh, some of the, the people that have gotten access to the GPT-3 models uh, have gotten it to generate applications, right? So it is uh, copywriting and uh, uh, data annotation and question answering. So, so, uh, what you do then is like when you when you in, interface with the API is, is that you have to set up some rules how to parse the answer. For example, if you ask a question, the GPT-3 model, it will just continue answering the question and then make up new questions on its own, right? So, but, but a programmer can, can of course, uh, uh, select the first question and, and see if it makes sense. So you can, you can, build la application layers on top of these answers with additional logic. And if the model holds up, if, if companies are able to, to use this in, in the processes, in internal annotation processes, I think we will see quite some use, but of course then they have to control for, for the errors that the model makes and, and see if that is like, that process in, in total is better than, than human work. Uh, we have heard that one of the limitations in, in, in taking GPT-3 to, to the Swedish or, or Nordic languages is, is the, the size of the corpuses where, where you train the, the model. One question that just came in from, from the audience is, would it be possible to use synthetic data that you use a, a, gen, a generative model that produces data and then have GPT train on that uh, computer generated Swedish language? Uh, I, I, I think uh, the simple answer is, is no. I mean, if you can build a generative uh, model to generate the data, you're, you're already done, right? Yeah. So, so uh, most likely not. But I'm not, uh, I honestly think that the Kobe resources at hand is, is uh, quite uh, good. I don't think we're so far off. I think the, 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 uh, the hardest part is the engineering and, and uh, infrastructure challenges for us, not the, not the data, even if it's, of course, also somewhat limited. Uh, early on, we heard that collaboration is, is important when, when building uh, these Swedish language models. What, what, what kinds of collaborations in, in what areas are, are needed? So I think we need to collaborate on both architectural design choices for Swedish. So as Ariel was talking about, these models use a specific type of input representation, which is called Viper encoding. And that's a sort of a data-driven approach that work, seems to work well for languages with at least one particular type of morphological structure. Um, it is not clear that that type of input representation is the most beneficial to use for all types of languages. And there are lots of outstanding questions in how we should build models to answer to the specific needs of, for example, the Swedish public sector. And one 
individual research organization will not have the capacity to, to do all that research. Okay then, uh, Johanna, my questions are, are uh, I, I've crossed them all out on my paper. Uh, do you have any left? No, I don't think so. Uh, but uh, yeah, really good questions from the audience today and uh, really interesting discussions. And uh, I really think we will have the reason to come back to this topic again. Uh, and also when we see more real world implementation on this, mo this model and things like that. So I think we'll come back to this topic. And uh, thank you, Love, Martin, Magnus, and Ariel and Anders, of course, um, for uh, being part of this uh, webinar. Uh, 